you guys will all know this. It's a nice little <coughs> test for those that don't know a lot about fast scanning. So a focus assessment with sonography in trauma. And what we're going to cover very briefly is the background, a little bit about physics, the indications, and then we'll just crack on with the hands-on stuff. And then we'll move on to some advanced things with Dan. Do any of you know when ultrasound was first used in trauma? It's a little historical perspective. 1976? Oh, not bad. Look, going straight for it. Yeah, not bad. So the 1970s in Germany, so Germans were streets ahead. And then picked up by the States in the 1980s, and it's now obviously our primary imaging modality in trauma, um, coming right after the primary survey in ATLS. Um, it's focused and goal-directed, so it's just worth remembering that all we're looking for is one thing. What's that one thing? Yeah, fluid. In two places. What are the two places? Yeah. Perfect. So we're looking for hemopotenium or hemopericardium. And you can do it in two minutes. Given that you're all experienced, in your centres, do you fast scan all of your trauma patients? That's really interesting. So um, at some areas, we fast scan all of our patients. Quite just, it's just a kind of departmental thing. So we get quite a lot of experience at doing it. Do any of you have radiologists that come down to your traumas? No. Also people yeah, fine. All righty. Is that right? Yeah. So we have them coming down, which is lovely, because A, they do it and they can supervise us, but also then you can have a, quite a nice little discussion about what imaging you might then go and do. But as you know, you can do it in two minutes. And the great thing is, while someone's messing around with the head end, doing airway manoeuvres, etc., you've done your primary survey, some, someone can get in and do the, the fast scan in the abdomen area while people are faffing around at the legs and the head and airway end. Um, you kind of know this, but I drive a car and I don't know how a car works. It's always just worth... <clears throat> reviewing this stuff but your probe has these piezoelectric crystals and one percent of those shoot out an ultrasound wave and 99 percent of those detect the return in signal and on the base of their delay and their intensity of that signal the software then generates an image that dictates what you see on the screen um, and the importance is when your SHOs drop the probe and break the crystals you get a nice little black line all the way down here so um, one of those things that you'll see on a few scanners in the ED um, and then you use a coupling gel just to get a really good contact between the skin and the signal. And that's obviously what you see, so superficially here and then deeper down here. You guys all know this, but this is what I teach those folk who are new to ultrasound, which is the five things you need to know about an ultrasound machine. The first thing is where it is, and that's often a big thing in our department because one of our regs uses this like a zimmer and uh, takes around the department, so you have to track him down if you want to know where the ultrasound is. Um, do you all have ultrasounds in your department? Yeah. It's fairly standard now, I think. Um, second thing is how to switch on and come around because um, we'll get all hands on in a second all the new ones are quite straightforward um, they're kind of like a laptop but if you come across some old machines in older or kind of I guess more less active A&E's they might have mechanical switch on the side so it's worth just familiarising yourself with your machine so where it is how to switch it on how to select a probe do any of you know this GE machine no yeah. So of those of you that don't, show me how you pick a probe, because I've got three probes here, so I've got a linear probe, echo probe, and that's the one I want. How am I going to pick it on this machine? Any idea? Just with a light <clears throat> pen. With a light pen. Oh, sorry, what? Yeah, so I want to select a probe. How do I select a probe on this oh, machine? Here. So, transducer, this... transducer, uh, no. transducer. Yeah, so these, this is the, the um, quirk of a GE machine. It's the preset button. It doesn't make any sense. On the old machines, it used to say probe preset, and they decided in their wisdom to take off the probe bit and just leave it as preset. So if you ever find a GE machine, click the preset, and it brings up kind of a little um, window, and you can scroll over to the probe you want, click select, and it loads up the software for your particular probe. Is that right? So where it is, how to switch on, how to select your probe. The gain, which is a dial on the GE machines. Um, I think it's a dial on most of the machines. Sonosite is a dial as well. And then the depth probe here. How to change the depth at the side. And obviously you've got your gauge. On the Sonosites, it's an up and down button. Um, and there, I think, the five basic things that you need to know how to work an ultrasound machine. Some of the Sonosite stacks have little buttons underneath with lights on. Have you seen those? They threw me. So the first time I saw that, I couldn't use it. Um, so you need to be able to select your probe by pressing the buttons underneath. There's a light telling you which probe you've got. Happy. That's what we need to know. So, should we scan? So you're happy to be our model, is that all right? Good. Well, you're all right to lie down. We'll keep you nice and covered up. <clears throat> uh, you've, uh, you show that you're very well trained, but you don't have to. You've... So in the setting of trauma, we're going to do three abdominal views uh, and one pericardial view. And what I'm after is our gel that I've just put down somewhere lovely. Thank you. So don't be afraid of the gel. It's a good... Um, 
good mechanism of getting a really good image. So, I always start with the right up quadrant. Anyone else start differently? It's just nice and easy, isn't it? Oh, you start self costly, nice. Um, it's so, like the pericardial view as well, because it's more immediate. Ah, uh, nice, okay. Effect, but otherwise, that's what quite makes sense because it's the most dependent. Where you're going to see yeah. the abdomen, so it's, it's going to be the most sensitive place to start. Yeah, and it's nice and easy, it gets your confidence up. But I didn't know that, it's quite a nice thought that you go pericardial first. Yeah. Um, Right up quadrant, the markers, the landmarks technically are the mid axillary line, the 8th to 11th intercostal space, but in practice you all know you just stick it on where you think you, the liver is. Um, and can you all see? Um, and then I keep the probe nice and flat and just move it vertically down. And what you want to see is liver and kidney in one view. So there we go, so that's quite nice. So you're all happy, you've got liver there, kidney, and you just want to see that space between liver and kidney. What's it called? Lead singer of the doors? Morrison patch, beautiful. Yeah, or hepatorenal space. Um, and all you're looking for is to make sure there's not a big black line of fluid there. So you'd see liver, big black line, kidney. Happy? You're happy with positive scans. Then I would flip the probe over, keeping that marker to your left or the patient's head. Um, and technically the landmarks are the posterior auxiliary line, six to ninth intercostal spaces. So it's just much further up and posterior than you imagine. So you pop the probe on. And this one's often tricky to get, but let's have a look. So, so you're just looking for a little landmark. So I'm pretty sure I'm getting kidney coming in here. So I'm keeping the probe nice and flat and just moving it posteriorly. Good. Can I get you to pop your arm out just slightly? Yeah, that's lovely. Good. So, are you all confident you can see kidney? Yeah. yeah just here. And a nice rib shadow there. And you've kind of got spleen up here. It's not the greatest view, but there. So spleen and kidney, but what you normally see is a lovely white, that really nice tight white capsule. Often don't see um, fluid in the right upper quadrant, but if you can turn the probe about 30 degrees and just move it superiorly, you can often get a nice view of the subphrenic space, which I'm not getting very well here. And that's often where you see fluid is just above the spleen, let's see. So not a great view at all. Maybe just a suggestion of it down here, but often you see a nice white line up here. You can see pleura coming in, can't you? And just under the diaphragm, that's often where you see fluid. Um, the bladder view, so again, keep your probe to your left, a nice horizontal um, view of the bladder. Man, lots of coffee, well done, excellent. Um, so just popping that vertically on the abdomen in the midline, and you get a really nice view of the bladder. So it looks almost like trapezoid. And you'd see fluid accumulating here in the retrovesical space in a man or the pouch douglas in a lady. Sometimes you need to scan right the way down into the bladder, but you've got a nice full bladder. And you can do a transver uh, horizontal view, sorry, um, just twisting that probe, and it looks a little more triangular. And again, just good for looking for fluid. And then the, the view that you guys do first is the four chamber subcostal view. This is the one that often, if your patient's got um, a real tender abdo, is a little uncomfortable. I hold the probe over, hand like that, so you can get nice and flat. Just pop it in the sub xiphoid space, and let's have a wee look. So we're getting some suggestion of movement there. I just want to make it a little bit deeper. Good. So we can get a deep breath. So if you get them to take a deep breath, your patient, nice and deep, 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 deep. Good. Perfect. You're getting some. And again, deep breath, really deep, 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 and hold it there. Beautiful. So it's not bad, but you ideally want to see liver and your four chain echo. So a nice deep breath for me. Deep, 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 bit deeper. Good. And out a little bit. Good. And hold it there. Ooh, in a bit. Good. So you've got a kind of a suggestion of liver up here in your four chain echo, and all you're interested in is that space between liver and your myocardium, you don't want to see liver, big black line myocardium. The chamber you see right next to the liver is the right ventricle. It kind of doesn't matter. That's the only bit you need to see. It's lovely if you see a great four chamber echo, very satisfying, but that's the only bit you need to see. Right up quadrant view, really straightforward. Just keep that probe nice and flat. And if you're not getting a good view, just move it posteriorly towards the bed, but make sure you're at 90 degrees. It'll give you a great view. Half a centimetre rim of fluid it equates to about 500 mils and a centimetre about a litre of fluid in the abdomen.
you're happy with positive scans, you're pretty comfortable, you can see the abnormality. So spleen, big black line, kidney, um, so a positive fast scan. This is right upper quadrant perisplenic fluid, so just subdiaphragmatically, you can see the fluid, you're all happy. <clears throat> um, your positive um, bladder scan, so this is a longitudinal view, bladder at the top right, and you can see fluid in the retrovesical space, you will see that. Good. Can you see the abnormality on this? Anyone who's less confident? Can anyone not see the abnormality on it? Can you see? No. Cool. Anyone help him out? So this is a nice sort of horizontal view of the bladder. So it looks almost trapezoid. Anywhere. So you're looking for fluid behind. Can you see any abnormality inferior to that? Yeah, just a little, little black, yeah. Black, really. yeah. So it's pretty subtle, but it's, it kind of jumps out at you. And when you see lots of normals, um, you kind of just get an eye for the fact that it's abnormal. As Dan was saying, it sort of jumps out at you. So more subtle, but actually, you know, fairly straightforward. It looks almost as dark as a urine in the bladder. You know that there's something going on. Happy. Um, it's just worth bearing in mind, and you all know this, but if you get a negative scan, what do you think? Surgeons. Surgeons, if it's negative. Yeah, cool. All right, anything else? How happy are you? Yeah, totally. So it's rule in and not rule out. And still inherently, when I get a negative scan, I kind of think, oh, great. And you kind of got to stop yourself and think it, it's like a positive D-dimer. It doesn't mean anything. It's just negative. So it's rule in, not rule out. If it's positive, bad surgeons. Um, if it's negative, just remember that it, you're taking one snapshot. So very recently we had a trauma patient had a negative scan, clinically deteriorated, re-scanned him. It was positive. So just bear in mind it's a dynamic situation. And you're using the scan as a surrogate for solid organ injury. So if you get a ruptured spleen or liver, you're looking for blood as a marker of the fact that you've injured a solid organ. And in the same way, you can have serious pathology, but a negative scan. So um, I saw a chap whose four-year-old lad jumped on his abdomen, transected his duodenum. Significant injury, but a negative fast scan. So don't be reassured by it. And that's the thing. Inherently, you kind of think, great, it's negative, but it's not. It's just not a positive scan. Happy. Um, you guys are all level one. Are you all level one signed off as well? Sort of ish. So that's a difficult thing is getting that kind of cohort of people to sign you off. But there's a real clear guidelines for the college. So um, make sure that you go through that process. It's kind of cumbersome, but the more people we get signed off and level two accredited, the more we can sign more people off and that process of getting the competence up. But it's very clear on the college website. Um, a number of um, documented logbook scans and then I think you need a minimum of 10 to 15 supervised scans and then a triggered assessment but try and get through all of that process. Do you have any questions on any of that? So we kind of covered all the basics of fast scanning, so the background a little bit about the physics and we all did the scan, you're all relatively experienced um, in that and then we took it on to some advanced stuff with Dan in terms of fluid assessment and you can see how that's going to be a really good skill for your sick resus patients.